Wilson, when he went back to South Carolina, he got everything that showed that I had cooperated against him. So, you know, he was furious. He's furious. Two, three months after that, maybe six months after that, I'm standing there at count. And there was a new guy who just gotten there that day. You know, yo, man, he said, uh, you know, a guy named, named, uh, uh, Matt Cox. And I looked at him and I went, yeah, I know him. Wilson said to let you know, he's at peace and he found Jesus. I said, okay, okay. Which was, you know, weird. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I am coming at you with part 10, I think, of my prison story. I uh, want to go ahead and mention, if you've been watching the whole thing uh, and you've enjoyed it at all, which, you know, is possible, then it, it, then think about joining my Patreon. And I know that's a, it's a shitty thing to do to throw that out there right at the very beginning, but I like to throw it out there and say, hey, this isn't like nobody – like, you know what else? There's a button now. There is a button down below the video, you know, where it says like. If you slide that bar, if you slide the kind of the like bar sideways, there's a button that says thank you. And you can actually thank me. If you hit the thank button, it allows you to donate like $1.99 or $4.99 or Ten ninety or nine ninety nine or so. It allows you different. It gives you different options, and it's like a thank you button. So do me a favor and hit the thank you button if you enjoy the video. So I am going to now talk about. I'm going to explain how I got my second reduction of my sentence because I had originally been sentenced to twenty six years and four months. I got it reduced to nineteen years and changed, like a few months, like um, nineteen years, six months. Maybe. Basically, I got like six. Seven years off. I got seven years off my sentence. And, but I'm still back. I went, I ended up back at Coleman and I ended up back at Coleman. And, you know, I talked to Frank, uh, who I just, in the last video, I just told his story, how Frank ended up in prison, Frank Amadeo. And I said, Frank, man, listen, you know, I appreciate you, you know, I appreciate you, um, you know, helping me and everything, but, you know, still got a lot of time. So he was like, yeah, something will happen, you know, we're, we're you know, Something will happen. It will. I remember he said. Um, he said the uh, we're going to have to eat this elephant one spoonful at a time. Like we'll get you another reduction, kind of like we'll we'll keep working on it. So okay. So you know I'm kind of hanging out. This is in 2000. So in early 2000, maybe maybe late 2014, probably late 2014. I ended up. I'm walking around the uh, the compound. In Coleman Low, the low security prison. I'm walking around the compound with a guy named Ron Wilson. Ronnie Wilson. You can look him up. Uh, he was a Ponzi schemer. Uh, and he um, he had run a Ponzi scheme for, f I want to say, $57 million. Uh, I think it brought in $100 million, paid back out like 40 some odd million dollars and he personally netted himself spent 40 or 57 million dollars like it lost 57 million dollars he just stole money and if you don't know what a ponzi scheme is a ponzi scheme is when new investors invest with someone like let's say they give you a thousand dollars and you tell them i'm gonna make you 50 percent on that thousand dollars in one year so or in whatever time frame so then as you show up six months later or a year later and you say, hey, I'm, I gave you $1,000. I now should have $1,000 or $1,500. I want my $1,500. Now, you didn't really invest that money. So how do you pay them the $1,500? Because you're continually telling people, you're, give me your money and I will earn you money. I'll do something with it. And so when the old investors show up and want their dividends – or their royalties, or their interest payment, or their profits, you've been taking in money from other new investors, and you can use that new investor money to pay the old investors. That's actually, it's a great scheme, and it, you can run it for a long period of time, but at some point, it obviously collapses. You know, it's a pyramid 
style an upside down pyramid where eventually it's just there's so much weight it just collapses on itself because you can't you just can't take in enough money to continually continually pay it out you know so bernie madoff couldn't do it charles ponzi couldn't do it um sam sam israel couldn't do it you know there, there's so many ponzi schemes are always running people are and then they're illegal so this guy ron wilson ran a ponzi scheme and ron wilson his Ponzi scheme collapsed and there was a uh, $57 million lost. So I'm walking around the compound with him, right? Like he's in my, my housing unit at, at Coleman. And I remember, it's funny because I remember meeting Ron and I remember he was standing there. He'd gotten there that day. He'd been given a cell and we were all standing in front of the, the front door in the unit. There's about 180 guys in the unit. We're all standing there. And he's a white guy, older white guy. And some of the white guys come up to me and they go, Cox, Cox. And I go, yeah, what's up? And they go, go talk to that guy. And they're looking at him and I went, why? And they go, they want, I want to know if he's a chomo. So they wanted to know if he was a sex offender, a, a child molester. And I remember looking at Ron and going, no, nah. no, nah, he's, he's here for fraud. And they went, man, why you say that? I said, nah, he's here for fraud. I can tell. The way he held himself, I knew he was there for fraud. And it's funny because the guy I was talking to was just Kenny King. Kenny King goes, yeah, man, he said he ran a, um, uh, shoot, um, like a, a scheme, some kind of, I go, Ponzi scheme? And he goes, a Ponzi scheme. Said he was running a Ponzi scheme. And I said, oh, okay. So I go over and I talk to him. I said, hey, I hear you're here for fraud. And he goes, yeah. He goes, uh, I'm here for and he tells me I'm here, I'm here for running a Ponzi scheme. And what, what Wilson's Ponzi scheme was this. Wilson had legitimately owned um, a uh, it's like a golden bullion, right? Like a golden or no precious metals and uh, bullion dealership where basically it's a precious metals um, dealership or dealership. A precious metals um, company where you would come in. And you could buy precious metals from him, right? Like you could buy whatever, gold, silver, um, platinum, whatever, whatever you want to buy. He would sell it to you. So, and they charge like one and a half percent. So you buy $100,000, he makes 1500 bucks, whatever. But he also traded precious metals. So he would buy and sell it as it goes up and down. <clears throat> and... He had done that for years successfully, you know, made okay money at it. Well, one day he said he just, after doing it for like 10 years, he decided he had a bunch of stuff he wanted to do and he thought, I could do everything I want to do right now if I just stopped buying the silver. Like, People come to me, they give me $200,000 and I buy silver with it and I we wait till it goes up and we sell it. If I just, he goes, these people never ask to see the silver. Like most of the silver is kept in a depository, a precious metal depository. So he never gets the silver. It's just kept in a, like a bank. And so he thought, eh, if these guys are giving me money and I, I could just stop buying the silver. So he thought about that and he thought, that's what I'm going to do. And I, why he did this, I don't know. He was doing okay. He said he wasn't making, you know, tons and tons of money, but he was doing okay. He lived in South Carolina. I don't know what doing okay in South Carolina means. Does that mean you're making 100000 a year? Does that mean you're making fifty or sixty? I don't know if it's making four hundred. He was, let's say he's making 100000 200000 a year, whatever. So he's doing okay. He just suddenly stops. He starts, keeps taking in money and he just stops buying the silver. So you give him $100,000 and he just spends it. If you want your $100,000 back, he just takes $100,000 from somebody else and gives it to you. Because there's no way that everybody asks for their money back at once. I mean, that's what he assumed. So eventually, Ron Wilson's entire, he did this for 15 years, by the way. 15 years, he took in over a hundred million dollars. I think it's like 108 or 109 million. I forget exactly. And he basically, so he's also paying out money. So he brings in, let's say 105 million. He paid out like 50 or 40, 
five forty six million dollars he paid out to people that had given him money and wanted their money back plus whatever they had made. So they give he gives somebody gives them five hundred thousand and two years later they're like, hey, I'm supposed to have a million dollars by now. I want my million dollars. He gives them a million dollars, but it's not it's somebody else's money. So eventually, what happened was Wilson had, Wilson did this for fifteen years. He the last few years he now he'd been married. He was married to a woman, Cassie or somebody. Um, I forget her name. His wife. Uh, he had a big farm. He had solar panels on the farm. He had a, a farm, like a, a he had a a, a a massive. It was a working farm. It was a real farm. He had a he had a big store where they sold all the farm goods. He had a what was called the heritage the heritage museum. So he had a museum that was set up um, that had all kinds of you know um, antiques in it. It was a big, big, huge uh, museum, something like twenty or thirty thousand uh, feet uh, or square feet. It was massive, you know, as museums are. So what he did was Ron would go out and he would give seminars about buying precious metals and he focused primarily on silver so he would go out and he would do these um these seminars well what eventually he starts having an affair with this one woman and i could tell you that whole story like i i probably know a good portion of his story i probably would be about 80 85 percent accurate like some some of stuff i'm not sure but he ends up meeting this woman and he starts seeing this woman and she's a um a financial planner so she's bringing him people Eventually, a woman contacts Wilson. Her father had given him like $100,000. She contacts him and says, hey, my father gave you $100,000. I want the, that $100,000 back. Now, this had been weeks earlier. And he was like, well, he gave me $100,000 like to invest in, in silver. I'll give you the money back, but I have to sell the silver. And he's like, and on top of that, I need your father to sign something saying he wants the money back. Like, I can't even really talk to you about it. And she's like, my father's 70 some odd years old. He doesn't know what he's doing. And he's like, well, I talked to him. He's pretty competent. He's invested with me before. I'm, you know, but if he signs the form, I'll get you your money back in 30 days or whatever. So now, of course, he hasn't got the money. But she throws such a fit about wanting the money back immediately, she ends up calling like the police. And it, it just, it, it ends up somehow or another, she raises such a stink. It ends up, it ends up starting some kind of an investigation. Like somehow or another. And Wilson was like, and I never really understood, like the investigation gets going. And so they start to look into like, where is this silver? Right. And Wilson puts up a little bit of a, of a, a kind of a fight. Like he doesn't give in right away. And so that makes them even more suspicious. And as a result, uh, the Secret Service comes in and they start investigating and the whole thing starts to unravel. His girlfriend is nervous. His wife finds out that he's having an affair. So Wilson comes in one day with his lawyer and goes to the Secret Service and he, he goes in there and he meets with them and he says, look, I've been running a Ponzi scheme. And now they arrest him. They let him out on bond right away. He meets with them. He goes and he digs up like, I want to say he digs up like $6 million in silver. Silver and cash. And gives that money over to the Secret Service. He ends up getting sentenced to 19 and a half years. Comes to Coleman, meets me. He and I are walking around the compound one day. I had just gotten back from getting my sentence reduced by seven years. So I just gotten back <clears throat> months earlier. He and I, are, he knows why he knows that I got my sentence reduced. He knows that I am more than willing to cooperate. I can't tell you how many times guys would come up to me and would say, Hey Cox, how much time you got? And I'd say, man, I got 26 years. I'd go, but, and I, I'd say, but somebody might fuck up and tell me where they, they buried a body and I'll be leaving next week. And they'd go, damn, bro, it's like that. And I'd go, it's like that. I didn't come here to make friends. I want out of here. 
So I would joke about it all the time. And Wilson would would say, God, you don't seem to have a problem at all. You know, t- t- telling people that. And I was like, no, I don't. No, I didn't advertise it. I didn't walk around telling everybody. But people knew and, and I would joke about it. Well, Wilson, after he got indicted, he cooperated against several financial planners that he knew. So he knew several financial planners that had raised money for him um, and had were doing their own little kind of scheme. And so he was he was cooperating with the Secret Service or the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Secret Service to you know, against these guys. So we're walking around the compound. And I remember Wilson said to me, he, I, I was like, well, hey, what, have you heard anything about that? How's that going? He goes, yeah, I've heard they they're doing this, they're doing that. They're gonna they're gonna ask me to come back and testify against these guys. And I said, oh, okay, that's good. You trust me. You want to testify. You want to testify. Like the, you become so important to them, so that when they go to re- if if the U.S. attorney then turns around and says, hey, your honor, we want to reduce this guy's sentence because he helped us in a conviction of these two guys. That's great, your honor. This inmate or this defendant told us about a crime and he he was interviewed. We then arrested these guys and they pled guilty and went to prison. That's great. That's cooperation. What's even better is if those guys then go to trial because then when they get in front of the judge, they say, your honor, he cooperated. We got an indictment. We arrested the guys. The guys then went to trial and th- this defendant testified against them in open court. That puts you in a lot of danger. Not that you're not in danger for cooperating anyway, because you are. But if I got up in open court and I testified against this person and that person gets found guilty, that is a that is a, an extreme amount of cooperation. That is is definitely um, considered a uh, of substantial assistance. You really substantially assisted. Now you, not that you don't always, you're not substantially assisting, but that there's just no way around that. It's almost impossible for the U S attorney to, to try and kind of fuck you out of giving you a reduction. If you actually testified and someone was found guilty, like that's over the top. Um, so Wilson's like, yeah, he's, he's going to have to testify. And I was like, that's great. So time goes on. We're walk, we, we walk around every night or two. We would walk around the compound or we would go out to the rec yard and walk the track. We're walking the track one day and he said, and I said, you know, I wonder how much, you know, how much time you'll get off. And he says, eh, he said, I don't think they're going to give me any time off. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, I don't think they're going to give me any time off. He goes, they really hate my guts. And, and even if I cooperate and they get a conviction, they're going to try and find a way to fuck me out of it. And I was like, I don't see how that's possible. And, and he goes, he said, yeah, well, you know, the problem, I said, they, they would need a specific reason. He goes, well, they have a reason. They think I've hidden Ponzi scheme money. They think I have money hidden that I didn't give them. And I go, I thought you gave them all the money. You dug up a bunch of money. Literally, when I say dug up, I mean, he took a shovel and dug like next to his house and dug a hole and dug up money that he had hidden there in these big aluminum um, ammunition. uh, Ammo comes in these big aluminum kind of uh, like they look like a big sardine can type of things. And these big – he had actually had these huge ammo cans that he had wrapped up money and gold and stuck in the cans and buried these aluminum things in the ground. I mean really – so he really dug it up. So I I just, the, the image of that is just, it's so hilarious. So, um, and I said, well, you dug up the money, you gave him the money. And he goes, yeah, I know, but they they don't think I gave him all of it. And I go, well, you did. And even if you didn't, I said, they would have to prove that they would have to find the money or prove that you still had the money. So don't worry about it. And he was like, yeah, listen, this, this went on and on months went by. So now we're into 2015, let's say. 2005, early 2015, Wilson says, as we're walking one day, he goes, they're going to fuck me out of this. And I looked at him and I went, why do you keep saying that, bro? I said, if they do, we'll get Frank 
to file uh, 2255, and we'll get we'll make him force them to give you a, a, a sentence reduction. And he goes, not if they find money. And I went, yeah, but you don't have any money. I said, you, they, you keep saying this money thing. I said, do you have money? Did you hide money? Are they going to find the money? And he looked at me and he goes, can I trust you? And I, I'm telling you right now, I looked at him and I go, probably not. And he just started laughing. He goes, <laughs> and he goes, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I, I, I did hide some money. I put some money away. I gave some money to my, my wife and some money to my brother to hold for me in case I, I get out of here. Now, Wilson is 64, 65 years old. He's like 65, 66 years old at this point. He's got a 19 and a half year sentence. There's probably a pretty good chance he's going to die in prison. No matter what, he's dying in prison. Not in great shape. Chunky, overweight, or fat. He was tubby, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I was just like, well, I said, I thought they'd talk to your wife. He goes, they did. I said, and she denied that she had any money. He goes, right. I said, well, then what are you worried about, bro? He goes, well, he said they're in, my lawyer said that they are, and my daughter said that they are re-interviewing people. They call, they ask questions. Eventually they're going to get to my wife. And I said, well, what are you worried about? She's already denied it. And he said, my, what I'm worried about is this. She now knows that I was having an affair. She's divorcing me. He said, I'm afraid that she'll tell them about the money just to fuck me out of getting a sentence reduction. And I thought, that's pretty possible, right? But... I, I was like, she, they, she's already told them she doesn't have anything. Like she didn't turn in the money. Like she would be admitting to a federal crime. Who would do that? He goes, oh, she'd do it just to fuck me. I said, well, then you're screwed anyway. And he was like, eh, I, don't know, I don't know. So I remember I went back to bed to the unit that night and I was laying in bed and I thought, is that enough to get a reduction? Like what this guy this old Ponzi schemer. And by the way, listen, I'm, I'm a, I'll tell you right now, like this is a guy who stole from churches, pension funds, retirees. He stole from individuals. This is not a nice guy. Like I'm not betraying a nice guy. But with that said, I'd also like to say, had he been a 19 year old looking at a life sentence, I'd have cut his throat too. So I don't want you to think, oh, Matt's not a bad guy. He's cooperating against a guy that cooperated, a, a bad guy that stole money. I don't give a shit about that. I want out of fucking prison. This is his problem. So I'm laying in bed and I thought, who, like, is that enough? And, and they didn't want to give me a sentence reduction the first time, right? So they didn't want to give me a sentence reduction when I, I genuinely deserved one. They didn't want to. They fought me tooth and nail. If it weren't for Amadeo, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here right now. So sat there and I went, that's not enough. It's not enough. It's not even worth making a phone call. Like, what am I, what are they going to recover? I thought for sure they won't, they're not going to charge his wife and his brother. They're not going to charge them. And two, he told me the amount of money he had stolen was like a, he gave it, he said his wife had 150000 in cash. And some precious, me some precious metal. And his brother had thirty thousand dollars. He said, "So it's not even two. It's not even a couple grand." And I remember thinking, "That's not enough. Like, like that's not enough to convince the j the U.S. attorney or the judge that I deserve my sentence reduced because I helped uncover this hidden money. And I know for that amount of money, they're not going to charge his ex wife and his brother." So I'm thinking, it's not enough. It's not worth doing anything about. So I don't do anything. I don't say anything. Weeks go by, maybe a month. So let's say a month later, I happen to call my attorney because I had asked my attorney to order the transcripts from when I had gone up to Atlanta to get my sentence reduced. She'd never sent them. She said she had to wait till they were transcribed, right? You can't, you can't get them right away. So, but I'd never gotten them. 
So I called her up and said, hey, I never got my transcripts. Like I wanted to add some of the stuff that was said. I wrote a book. You know, I wrote, I have a book. And I, I wanted to add that that me going back up to, to Atlanta and getting my sentence reduced, I wanted to add some of the things that were said during that hearing, right? So it's only a couple of pages, maybe two or three pages about me going back up there and what was said. But I want to pull from the transcripts, right? directly. I want it because, you know, I don't remember verbatim what these people said. And if I have a, a copy of the transcripts, well, then you could get to, you get to do the whole quotes and the whole thing. And it's, it's just better. So I call her up and I ask her for the transcripts and she says, look, man, I'll, I'll order them right now. And she said, I'll make a note and everything. And she says to me, so what's going on? And I go, what, what do you mean? And she said, anything going on in there? And what's so funny about this woman was she never wanted to talk to me. Like, this is a public defender. She's not interested in having a conversation with me. So, you know, she 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 didn't want to do much of anything, any you know, when she was being paid. Now she's not even being paid. And she said, anything going on in there? I was like, um, no, nothing, nothing. And she goes, okay, well, I'll get those started. She, she said, let me know if there's anything you want to talk about or anything happening that you need me to look into. Or, And I remember thinking, this is weird. Maybe she was just having a slow day, but I remember I stopped and I go, you know what? I said, something happened a few weeks ago. I, and she goes, what's that? And I went, well, there's a guy here named Ron Wilson. And she goes, hold on, let me look him up. She looks him up. She goes, oh yeah, this is a bad guy. Why, what happened? And I went, he told me that he's actually hidden Ponzi scheme money. And she went, Really? I said, yeah, and the, the Secret Service is investigating him still to this day. Even though they got a conviction, they're still investigating. They're still looking for money. They're trying to re recover money. I mean, look, if this guy ripped your grandmother off or your mother for $300,000, then they're trying to get you – get the Secret Service is trying to get grandma's money back. So she goes, oh, this is a bad guy, Matt. This guy ripped off a lot of people. I said, yeah, I know. And she went, you know what? She said, you know where the money is. I said, I know who has the money. And she goes, how much money were we talking about? I said, not a lot. Like, like maybe, less, like not even 200,000. And she goes, let me make a phone call. She says, let me, do you know the name of his, his secret service agent? And I happen to name it. His secret service agent was, um, it was uh, Griffin. I want to say the last name was definitely, it was Agent Griffin. I forget what his first name was. Anyway, she tells me, yeah, you know what? She said, let me make a phone call. I said, okay, well, um, send me an email or something. She goes, okay. And I hang up the phone. So I don't hear anything from her. I, like a week later, a, a, this a CEO came, comes up to me and he goes, hey, Cox. And I go, what's up? He goes, you need to go to SIS. SIS is where you go. Like they're like special invest the special investigative um, services. They investigate the other the BOP the the other police or the other correctional officers, and they investigate like drug pro you know things within the prison. But they're not COs. Like they're like the FBI for inside of the BOP. And if you get called there, there's a reason. I actually got called there a lot because I was writing guys' stories. And so when I was write someone's story, I would get I would order the Freedom of Information Act and paperwork would get mailed in. But it's so they're getting mail in that looks like legal work or people's arrest reports and their other inmates. Well, I'm not allowed to have other inmates materials, especially not legal work. And so I've got somebody's FBI report coming in or somebody's arrest report coming in. So they would end up sometimes they would intercept it and they would call me. And tell me to come get my – I go there and they go, what are you doing? You're getting this guy John Boziak's fucking police report in. It's got a mug shot. Like, who is this? And I'd tell them, oh, this is – I'm writing a story. And I'd explain it to them. And because I'd been writing stories and I'd gotten guys in magazines and I had a book published at this point, they would go, oh, okay. All right. Well, cool. Here. And they'd give it to me. So I get told to go to SIS. So I, I kind of think it's for like, what is it? Well, maybe it's for mail? I didn't know. So I go there. I go to um, SIS. I knock on the door. The lieutenant, the SIS lieutenant comes in, this big fat guy. He was a dickhead. He goes, come here. He goes, Cox. Yeah, come here. And I go, what's up? He goes, sit down. So I sit down. Now I think, fuck, I'm in trouble. Like, now I'm worried. Now I might end up in the shoe. 
or the special uh, special housing unit. So it's the whole. So I was like, fuck, what did I do? And he goes, sit down. And I sit down. And this guy's such a dick. So he picks up the phone. And he starts dialing a number. And he goes, yeah, yeah, this is this is Lieutenant so-and-so. Yeah, I got Cox right here. Hold on. He goes, here. And he hands me the phone. He goes, and I go, what's going on? He goes, talk. He goes, talk. I'm like, Jesus. So I go, yeah, who's this? And the guy goes, hey, this is uh, Agent Griffin with the uh, South Carolina Secret Service. He goes, I understand that you know where Ron Wilson buried or um, hid some money, hid Ponzi scheme money. And I went, oh, whoa. Like now I know what's happening. And I went, um, um, apparently my lawyer had called this guy and he was super excited and he immediately scheduled a time to get me separated from the other units in a place where he could talk to me. So I go, um, wait a second. I said, you know what, bro? Uh, I said, let me think about this. He goes, what do you know? I said, no, no, I know. But the last time I helped you guys out without anything in writing, I got fucked over. So I need you to write me a letter. And I need you to write me a letter that says that you will reduce my sentence if I can help recover Ponzi scheme money. I said, this isn't a lot of money, bro. Like, I'm not telling you, this isn't millions. This isn't even half a million. Okay, this is maybe a couple hundred thousand. And he goes, well, a couple hundred thousand would help. He said, so I I will, I promise you, I will, you will get a reduction. And I went, no, that's the problem, bro. You as an FBI agent cannot promise me anything. Like you don't, you don't have the ability to promise me anything. The only person that can promise this is the U.S. attorney. And I need the U.S. attorney to know that I'm working with you and I'm helping you to get my sentence reduced. So I need that letter. He goes, okay, all right, Cox, give me your email address. And I go, ah. so I explain to him how the email system works and he gives me his email address and I have to get him approved, whatever. So then I leave. I go back to the unit and I get him approved and I send him an email. He sends me one back and he says he's working on it. And it takes about a week or two, about two weeks. And I don't do dick. Like I don't tell him nothing. So for two weeks I wait. And then suddenly I get this email that says from the U S attorney that says if Cox and it says that they've spoken with the U S attorney in Atlanta. And it says that if Cox, if Matthew Cox helps recover a significant amount of money or gives us information that helps us recover money or get an in- indictment on individuals, we will consider that substantial assistance and reduce this sentence. Now, that's the best you're going to get. That's not a promise. It's we'll consider it, which means we'll think about it. And then that's the way they get out of it. I had already had this happen multiple times where I say, hey, I did this, I did this. Well, you said you, you'd consider it substantial assistance. And they said, we did consider it. And it's not. So I, I didn't, I knew that was the, but I, they're also not going to put it in a, they're not going to promise me anything. So I thought, that's the best I got. And I do have something in paper that says that they know and that they did kind of make this agreement. So in my opinion, it's an agreement. Um, so I then talked to the agent and I explained that Wilson told me his wife is holding money and his brother's holding money. The agent turns around and subpoenas multiple people. Okay? So he subpoenas multiple people. But the other thing that the agent does is he and another agent start emailing me on a regular basis, maybe two, three times. Sometimes it's three times a day. Sometimes it's once or twice a week. But asking me to ask Wilson questions. Like, can you find out what Wilson knows about this person? And so when I walk the track with Wilson, I would try and bring up a subject that would relate back to what they had asked me. Now, sometimes they asked me these super blatant questions that were like, there's no fucking way I can ask this. Like, what are you doing? I don't even know who this person is. There's no way for me to introduce this person into a conversation without sounding like I'm, I'm from a fucking, um, I'm a fucking CI. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm wired up. And it's so funny, too, because I'd ask them multiple times, why don't you just fucking send me a, a wire me up and have me talk to this guy? He openly talks about how he's working with all of these different people and this person helped and that person helped and where the money is and this and that. Why don't you? But they can't do that. They can't wire you up in prison. So and listen, that's like that. If I had done that, like that's like you get stabbed. 
Like I could have seriously gotten myself fucking hurt. Asking some vague questions that could be construed as being overly inquisitive is one thing. You wearing a wire on another inmate will get you fucking hurt. Well, but I was willing to do it because I thought maybe, you know, I could help myself here. So Wilson and I are walking around and I'd ask, I'd ask some basically some kinds of questions and we'd come back and then I'd send them an email and say, this is what he said. So that goes on for a few months. Well, eventually they interview his wife and his brother. You know what was so funny about that is there were, there were times when I was like, no, no, this is what happened. This is what he told me happened. And they would come back and they'd say, he's lying to you. I remember one time he had told me about this, this, the chick that he was having an affair with. And he was super in love with this chick. So he was telling me about when he had met her, this, and she found out about the Ponzi scheme and he had done this and he had done that. And he met her here. And, and I was like, well, what sparked that conversation that she figured it out? Like, how did that happen? And he was like, well, and then he told me how it happened, that she wanted to invest money with me. And then I eventually had to tell her that the Ponzi scheme wasn't true. I'm sorry, that the, my investments aren't investments, that there is no trading. I'm not trading this silver. I'm not even buying the silver. I'm just spending the money. It's a Ponzi scheme. So she, he at some point tells her this. And so when I, and I tell them when it was and where it was, and they come back and they go, that's not true. I know, we know that's not true because you're saying that she got money from when her, they sold her mother's condo. And you're saying that her mother had a large amount of money also. And we know that's not true because there was no money. We would have seen the money. We would have seen the sale and we would have seen this. And so, but I knew the time frame. So I went back and I explained, look, it was one of the last times he was, because Wilson was also a city, uh, a, a council member, city council member. Said it was at this time, so it had to be on this day, and that was two days after. The, like I break it down on when it is, like it's at the end of September. So in the last part of September, they, she got money, her mother got money from a workman's comp claim, and they wanted to invest that money in um, in the Ponzi scheme, not knowing it was a Ponzi scheme. And I know because they met at the mother's condo and a, two weeks later they sold the condo and wanted to invest that money too. And so she was talking to him about the money. And the, so I had the exact time frame within two weeks. And so they go back and they check and they come back and they go, wow, we had no idea. Like we found out when the condo was sold. We found out when he had been the, so it would have been in this time frame. In addition to this time frame, we also found that she, her mother did get a large workman's comp, like half a million dollars, large workman's comp payout. You know, like they were like, wow, you know, your information is spot on. So they asked me a bunch of stuff and I tried to help what I could, but you know, some of the stuff was just ridiculous. Like I was like, you're gonna get me fucking killed asking me this shit. So I can't ask that. There's just no way. So there's some stuff that's impossible. Well, eventually they get to the point where they've milked me and I've milked him for as much information as possible. And they call his, they call Wilson's wife in. Now, Wilson's wife hates his guts. She's in the middle of divorcing him. She's more disgusted by him, but for having an affair than having ripped off all of their friends and family and their church for, <laughs> 50, 60 million dollars. She's more upset because he's banging this fucking broad on the side than, he, than he's a fucking Ponzi schemer. So she comes in and she says, and they ask her a bunch of questions and she says, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any money. And she leaves. Well, she went home that night and she thought about it and she realized just how fucking much trouble she was in. She got all the funds that she had together that he'd given her and she went back in and she gave them about 350 to $400,000 way more than he told me she had 150,000 in a combination of cash and precious metals. She had like 300,000 in cash plus gold bullion and all kinds of fucking shit. 
So she fucking throws down three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand and says, Here, I didn't return this to give this to you yesterday. I was scared. I didn't know what to say, but here's the money. I do have money. This is everything I have. That was it. The next day, or a couple days later, his brother comes in with his lawyer, walks in to meet with the US, or with the Secret Service, walks in, sits down, and says, "Before we get started, I'd like to hand, I'd like to give you something that my brother gave me," and hands them one hundred fifty thousand in cash, not thirty, one hundred fifty thousand in cash. So it's over half a million dollars that they've recovered because because I I sp- because I spoke with them because I happened to mention to my lawyer. So they re-indict Wilson. He gets put on a bus. And you have to think, I I know he's been indicted. Like literally, I know he's been indicted days before he's been indicted. They tell me he's been indicted. He's going to find out in the next couple of days. You know, let us know what he says. And so, you know, he one day comes up to me and goes, well, they they indicted me. Like what? He's like, they indicted me. I go, for what? My fucking wife turned in a bunch of money. My brother turned in a bunch of money. And I went, the money you gave him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So half about half a million dollars. I went, half a, I thought you said you gave her like a hundred thousand or a hundred, what'd you say you gave her? Like a hundred grand. He goes, no, I told, I I think I told you 150,000 or something. He said, I didn't know. I didn't think I could trust you. I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to tell you the exact amount, but yeah, yeah. She turned in all this money. And I was like, holy shit. And I go, he goes, what do you think is going to happen? I go, you're fucked, bro. Like, you're fucked. And so I was like, Jesus. And he goes, I said, um, he goes, what do you think I should do? And I went, I think you should go to trial. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm thinking, if you go to trial, I get to testify at the fucking trial. <laughs> like, you got to go to trial, bro. I said, you need to go to trial. You need to go to trial. I, if I was, I said, you need to go to trial and say, you don't know what your fucking wife took. You don't know what your brother took. Like, sounds like they were fucking stealing from you. Like, I would go to trial. Like, I'd make these fuckers work for it. There's a good chance you get off altogether. And <laughs> I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, huh? Huh? I said, what do you have to lose? Fuck these guys. Because he was big on fuck the government. He hated the government, right? Like, he hates them. He hates them because they caught him. And he's like, oh, these motherfucking bastards. These, and I'm like, you gotta go to trial, bro. So <laughs> anyway, he gets on the bus a couple days later. He goes uh, back to South Carolina. He gets there. It turns out he he just takes a plea. He pleads guilty. Fucking pussy. <laughs> Jerk off. He should have gone to trial. So he goes to, or he, he, he pleads guilty. He gets six more months. Can you believe that? He pled guilty to lying to an FBI agent. I think it was lying to an FBI agent and obstruction of justice. His wife and his, um, his wife and his, his wife and his, um, brother end up getting, um, they both get obstruction of justice. His wife gets a year, a year probation. And she has to do like 50 hours community service. His brother, because he never lied to anybody, he had never been asked. He walked in and just gave him the money. So they're like, eh, 50 hours community service, no probation. Like he didn't have anything. I don't think either one of these people even got a felony. Neither one of them did over a year um, of, uh, of, of paper. So I think that it was like a slap on the wrist or maybe they got a felony. I don't know. Either way, they, they didn't do any jail time. Wilson got six months added on. He has 19 and a half years and he got six more months. So it bumped it up to 20 years. So my first thought is, you know, wow. Like that's, that's not good. Like they gave this guy six more months. They recovered half a million dollars, but they only gave him six months. Like, I don't think they're going to give me anything. And sure enough, A month goes by, two months go by, three months go by. I mail a letter to the U.S. attorney. Hey, where's my sentence reduction? What's going on? I send him copies of like, you know, the email or not copies of the email. I just send him uh, like I I send him. I basically because I didn't send him. a. No, I did. I sent him a copy of the email. 
hey, you guys said this. I need my sentence reduced. What's going on? Just nothing. Then I end up calling the Secret Service agent, and he tells me, look, I don't know what's happening. I put in, he says, I put in a request for you to have a reduction, but I can't file it. The U.S. attorney has to file it, and there's just nothing I can do. And I go, I want a copy of that reduction or that request. Can you send it to me? And he said, Matt, I'm sorry, I can't. Keep in mind, prior to this, when I had spoken with him, he'd promised me he was going to, one, get me a reduction. Two, he promised he would send me a copy of his request for a reduction. Now he said he can't. He was told he wasn't allowed to release it to me. So now I know. And I said, who said that? He said, I really would prefer not to say. So now I know that the U.S. attorney is trying to not reduce my sentence. So I go to Frank and I explain it to Frank. Here's what's happening. Talk to Frank about it. And Frank goes, okay. He says, how many emails do you have? I had like 110 emails back and forth, back and forth over the course of six months, eight months. So I go through them and I show them to, to him and he's like, well, okay, yeah, this is definitely cooperation. And then I show him the one letter that where they promised or they, they agreed that they would re- do it. And he goes, oh, wow. So he files a 2255 on my behalf in late 2015. <clears throat> the U.S. attorney responds to the, the judge gets it. And the judge in my case says, tells the U.S. attorney, you need to respond to this. Like, this is what this guy's saying. Is this true? They come back and say, your honor, we don't know what he's talking about. We ha- don't know that we're, we're not working with Mr. Cox. We don't know of any, uh, we don't know of any agreement. So I then respond to that by sending a copy of the letter. The judge comes back and says, wow, like you guys need to respond to this. So they respond and they say that they're looking into it. But regardless, Mr. Cox is time barred. It has been more than a year since his since his initial sentence. So he cannot file a motion. He cannot he cannot ask for a reduction. He cannot ask to remove his plea. He cannot like like he can't file any of this. You need to dismiss this. So the judge says, "Listen, it has been more than a year." Now I argue what's called equitable tolling. I argue that every time that they've asked me to do something, it extends my year. And that's a loose argument. It's it's a very weak argument. And in some in some some districts they 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 actually will allow this, but not in the district, the middle district of Georgia. I'm sorry, the northern district of Georgia, which is where I was, is a notoriously closed minded system, and they they refuse to acknowledge that. So the judge says, "Look, I don't believe that I have the right to to rule on this." So I'm going to allow you to appeal it. And there's something called a certificate of eligibility or certificate of eligibility to appeal. You have to basically prove that you have a case to win a certificate of eligibility the, in order to appeal his decision. So, But the judge says, I am waiving the certificate of eligibility. Also, you have to pay $500. He says that I'm waiving the fee. And I am, ask, and I am allowing Mr. Cox to... to um, to appeal this to the appellate court. So that's basically telling the appellate court, like in legal jargon, like they have these little things that they do to kind of give messages to each other. That's basically telling the, that is basically telling the appellate court that if it's possible, he wants to rule on it, but he needs their permission. And so we file a motion. And as soon as we file the mo- a motion, the appeal, immediately the the U.S. attorney comes in, my U.S. attorney comes in and he files a Rule 35, a, a, a request for a sentence reduction. So he requests that I get my sentence reduced by one level, which would have been at that point, at the levels I was, at the as low as I was, would have been like 21 months. Because every time, every level that comes off, it's less. So if he had asked for two levels, one level would have been 21. The next one would have been probably 19 months. So 21 months off, next one would be like 19 months off. Next one might be 17 months off. Like they continually get lower. So 
at the remaining levels that I had, that I was serving, that was like 21 months. So he says, hey, give him 21 months off. And I'm like, the fuck you? Like, what the hell? So I go to Frank and me, as soon as I get this letter in the mail, it's like a Monday. Or no. Yeah, no, no. It was a, it was like a, a Tuesday or a Wednesday. It had been mailed out Monday and I got it Wednesday. So I get it, go to Frank, show it to him. And Frank, go, and I go, Frank, what if the judge rules on this? If the judge rules on this, you're fucked. But ju- Frank didn't say fuck because he didn't cuss. He goes, oh, no, you're, you're screwed. You're screwed. No, we, we can't let the judge rule on this. I go, well, he, he they filed it. He's, they filed it. He's going to sign it. And he said, no, I think your judge will wait. But regardless, we're going to get something in the motion into the mail right now. So he immediately fi- types out a motion for me. And we get it in the mail the next day. So they get it by Friday. So it was in the mail that night. But I think it goes out the next day. So they got it by Friday or Monday. By Tuesday, what Frank has asked for is he says he wants to stay on the motion. He wants to be able – he's asking for me to get an evidentiary hearing so that I can present evidence to the court for the amount of cooperation that I've given, which exceeds a one-level reduction. Now, the judge rules on it immediately. The judge says, boom, I'm staying all proceedings. I'm ordering an evidentiary hearing, and I am requesting – and I am I am giving Mr. Cox an attorney. So they give me an attorney. The attorney flies down. She comes in. She meets me at the attorney client um, conference room, which is in the visitation area. I go down there. This takes place over the course of months. So she, by the time she flies down, she flies down. I walk in. I meet her. Her name is Leanne. I want to say her name's Leanne. She comes down. Leanne something. I don't remember. Anyway, she comes in and Leanne sits down and she, and she says, you know, we introduce each other and she says, listen, I've read your motion and it's well written and everything, but you don't have a, a prayer. Like you don't have a chance of winning this. You, you're going to lose this at the appellate level. And I went, well, if I don't have a prayer of winning, then why did, why are you here? Because she came to negotiate with me between me and the U.S. attorney to try and get more time off. U.S. attorney said one month, I said one level, and we wanted more. And so she says, I said, I mean, think about it. If they could crush me so easy, why are you here? Why don't they do it? Why don't they? Why are they offering? Because they were now offering like two levels. And she goes, well, I mean, I, I said, why wouldn't they just say, fuck you, Cox? And let it go forward and and beat me at the appellate level. I said, you're here because they think I might win. And she went, well, I don't think you have a chance of winning. I said, if that's the case, then why are you here? Why wouldn't they say, don't even fly down and see him? We're not going to give him nothing. She thought about that and she said, I don't, I don't know. She said, what do you, what do you want to do? I said, well, Frank told me to tell you that I won't accept to, that we want to ask for five levels off. If I don't get five levels off, that I'm going to appe- continue with the appeal. And she says, five levels. I said, yeah, ask for five levels. I'm hope we're hope. I said, no, I said four. I said, ask for, we're asking for four levels. I won't take less than four levels. That's it. And she goes, okay. I said, also, I need you to put in a motion to start getting evidence. So I want to have an evidentiary hearing in front of the judge and what I want to do is I want to have an evidentiary hearing with all with the secret service agents. I want them to be um, subpoenaed. I want the FBI agents that initially investigated my crime in Florida. And I want the secret service that investigated me in Atlanta. So I want everybody there and I want to see all of my documents in my personal case and all the documents in, in Wilson's case. And she is Matt, That's gotta be 10, 20, 30,000 pages. I went, yeah, I know. She said, that'll take months. I said, it'll take months and thousands and thousands of dollars and manpower too. Thousands of dollars of manpower. She says, what do you want to do? She says, you want to subpoena all these people? She says, what do you want to do? Turn this into a circus? I go, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to make this as fucking painful as possible. And I said, I'm just trying to bluff them into giving me more time. And if they think that I'm going to have six 
federal agents show up, plus the U.S. attorney for the Southern District, plus I want 30,000 documents, they're going to bend. And I said, and, and I said, that's what, and she goes, I said, that's what Frank said to do. She goes, who's Frank? And I explained, Frank is a bipolar, disbarred attorney that believes he's going to be emperor of the world and he's doing all my legal work. And she says, you have an incompetent attorney? I said, he's not incompetent. I said, he just thinks that God wants him to be emperor of the world. Doesn't seem to affect his legal work. And Frank is what got me here. And if Frank's so nut, and she goes, that's insane. I go, if he's so insane, I said, what are you doing here? I said, she goes, why would you hire this guy? I said, I didn't hire him. He did it for free. And I said, and I let him work on my legal work because all the sane attorneys that I contacted on the street told me I could never get the, a sentence reduction, that it was un, impossible to force the government to reduce your sentence. I said, and yet I've already done it once and I'm doing it again. And she went, wow. She said, that's crazy. I said, yeah, it's crazy. And she goes, okay, I'll go back to the government, but I don't think they're going to do that. And I said, well, we'll see. She goes back. Months later, we go back and forth, back and forth. Months later, they come back and they say, two level. They'll give you two levels. That's it. I said, send them the motion telling them, draft the motion, send it to them, telling them all the things you want and tell them that you're going to file it with the court. You don't have to file it. Just send it to them. Draft it. Call them up and you don't even have to draft it. Call them up and ask them like, hey, by the way, what's the name of the Secret Service agent here and there? Oh, by the way, since that time, we I ordered a Freedom of Information Act, and I got, I I ordered a Freedom of Information Act, and I got a copy of the paperwork that the Secret Service agent had sent to the U.S. Attorney requesting I get a sentence reduction. So we now can include that, telling the judge the Secret Service thinks I need a reduction, and they said it was substantial, and like we because. The, the U.S. attorney had actually said in one of their motions that Cox didn't cooperate. He, he cooperated, but his cooperation did not yield much of a result. So when I send them the thing with the Secret Service agent, it's like three or four pages talking about how much I cooperated, how I, there was no investigation. They had nothing until I came on. I was their sole witness. I was, I mean, it was just overwhelming. And they were covered half a million dollars and that he deserves a sit. I mean, so it's like they're saying, oh, the Secret Service said he barely helped at all. Secret Service documents said, like, they're just catching them lying left and right. Um, so we get that in. They now know we have that. She goes to them and says he wants to see the Secret Service agent, these two agents, these Secret Service agent, this Secret Service agent, this FBI agent, this FBI agent. He wants to subpoena the U.S. attorney um, I'm from the Southern District of, of South Carolina. Middle District? Uh, whatever, South Carolina. And so the U.S. attorney, so the U.S. attorney in Atlanta comes back and they say three levels. We'll give them three levels. So I, I call up Leanne. And I said, "Hey, what's up?" She goes, "They said three levels. They'll give you three levels." And she goes, "So I'm going to go ahead and put the motion in and schedule the the evidentiary hearing." And I went, "No, no, 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 no! I'll take the three levels." She goes, "What? Why?" She goes, "You said." You would only accept four levels. I said, no, no, no. Frank said to tell you I'd only accept four levels. We always, we never wanted more than three. Three's fine. And she goes, um, okay, all right then. So she tells U.S. Attorney three levels is fine. They put in a motion. I did not go back to court that time because I didn't want to because there I could only hurt myself. At that point, they're saying three levels. We're saying three levels. I know the judge is going to give me three levels. Like if I went back to court, I could only hurt myself. So what happens is they give me three levels off. That three levels basically was five years off my sentence. So I got one sentence reduction for seven years. And I talked about that in another video. And I got another sentence for five, another sentence reduction for five years. Now, here's what's funny about that is that keep in mind that Wilson, when he went back to South Carolina, he got his discovery. In his discovery, he got um, a list of all of the emails that I'd sent. He got everything that showed that I had cooperated against him. So, you know, he was furious. He's furious. Initially, he's upset, and he mailed a letter 
back to the prison to um to his old roommate and it's all saying that you know um basically what had happened and so i remember going to uh, people then people start telling me about this letter that he this guy's walking around showing it to everybody so i end up going to his roommate and i tell his roommate if one more fucking person tells me about this letter that you've got and you're showing everybody I said, I'm going to go into the lieutenant's office and I'm going to tell them that I'm in danger that you're here. And I said, they're not going to ship me anywhere, but they're going to ship you to FDI or FCI Baghdad. You're never going to fucking see your family again because this guy's family lived in the area. They'd actually move there to be near him. And I said, don't. I said, if I have one more fucking person tell me about this letter. And he's like, and I said, now are you going to get rid of it? He goes, yeah. I said, anybody else going to come out? He goes, no. I said, okay. That was it. Second thing that happened was I was wait about two, three months after that, maybe six months after that, I'm standing there at count. And there was a new guy who just gotten there that day. And he actually happened to be in the, in the, in the cell across from me. So I'm waiting for count for the guards to come around and count everybody. I'm standing at my cell, just standing there. And there's this black guy who's standing there. We're just standing there waiting for the guards to walk by. And you know, they haven't started counting yet. So there's a little bit of chatter, but not a lot. And so the black guy looks at me and he goes, Hey man, I said, yeah, what's up? He said, how long you been here? I was like, oh, I don't know. I've been there like fucking, it's been like 10 years or something. I don't know. I said, why, what's up? He said, man, now keep in mind, this is a black guy and I'm a white guy and there's not a lot of white guys. Like most of the white guys know each other. There's only 1800 people in this prison. Most of them are black and Hispanic. So, you know, you want to find a white guy, you ask and I would another white guy. So he looks at me and he goes, yo man, he said, uh, uh, you know, a guy named, named, uh, uh, Matt Cox. And I looked at him and I went, yeah, I know him. And he goes, okay. He said, I need to talk to him. I said, about what? He said, I just need to talk to him. And so I pull my ID out and I hold it up to him and I go, I'm Matt Cox. And he goes, oh man, oh shit. I said, what's up? He said, you know a guy? And he kind of looks around. You know a guy named Ronnie Wilson? I said, yeah, I know Ronnie Wilson. And he goes, uh, he told me to give you a message. And I go, what's that? And he goes, he told me to let you know that he understands what happened. He said to tell you that he hopes you get as much time off your sentence as you can. And he'd have done the same thing to you. Now, keep in mind, by this point, I've already been had my sentence reduced. And I was like, oh, okay. Because, see, he was in South Carolina with Ron Wilson. And I looked at him and I went, is this going to be an issue for you and I? He goes, nah, man, nah, it ain't going to be an issue. He said, listen, bro. He goes, I got three or four years. He goes, but I tell you right now, I'm going to be out of here in six months. He goes, you know what I'm saying? I said, yeah, I know what you're saying. He goes, all right, all right. And he goes, oh yeah, one more thing Wilson said. I go, what's that? He goes, Wilson said to let you know He's at peace and he found Jesus. I said, okay, okay. Which was, you know, weird, a little weird. I don't know if he found Jesus. I don't know what happened. I don't know what that was about, but apparently he wanted me to know that he'd found Jesus. Now, here's another interesting thing before I wrap this whole thing. Um, Ron Wilson is not in prison anymore. When COVID came, Ron Wilson was released. Ron Wilson had 20 years. He did about six years. Ron Wilson is at home and he lives with his daughter in South Carolina. He did six years. That's all he did on a 20-year sentence. So he got out on COVID. He's at home. I thought about looking him up. I bet Ron Wilson would have no problem at all talking to me. Ron Wilson loved me. And Ron Wilson would have cut my throat. Without hesitation. That old man would have cut my head clean off my body with a nail file to get out of prison. So I'm not worried about it. I'd actually probably go have lunch with Ron Wilson. I don't think he can have lunch because he's probably on an ankle monitor. But regardless, I like the old guy. So... I ended up getting my sentence reduced. 
And uh, at that point, I really had very little time left. I had like a year, two years left, and I thought I was going to get a year halfway house. And at that point, the Bureau of Prisons starts threatening to send me to a camp. So I'm at the low, and now they want to send me to a camp. But I don't want to go to a camp because my mother comes to see me every two weeks. And I didn't, you know, my mom had had a stroke and I thought if they moved me, the closest camp was Miami. If they sent me to Miami, I mean, that's like a four hour drive. She can't go four hours like that. That'd kill her. So I was concerned and I didn't want to be moved. And I'm going to explain what I did in order to not get myself moved from Coleman Lowe to a camp. And it's actually a super funny story. And I will let you know what happens in the next video. And it's great. And stay tuned, and I appreciate you guys um, sticking with me and checking this out, and I appreciate it. And if you like the video, do me a favor and hit the what are they hitting? They're hitting the thumb that no, they're no, they're hitting the the like, they're hitting the subscribe button and the like button and the notification bell, the little bing. If Connor remembers, he can put a little bing here. So um, hit the thing. Also, YouTube has a new feature. And it's right down there on the bar where the same bar that has the little thumbs up. It's on that same bar. You slide it sideways and it's got a little thing and it says thank you. And you can actually thank me by giving me like $1.90 or $4.90 or $9.99. I don't know what they all are. But anything would help because YouTube ain't paying. They're barely paying my bills. So they're not even paying my bills. What am I talking about? This is This is like charity. At this point. So do me a favor. Leave me, do, do, you know, hit, hit me up. Give me a, throw me a thanks. I appreciate it. And, um, and for those guys that are saying, damn Cox, you're like begging and shit. You're right. I am begging. It's not beneath me. So leave a comment. I will try and respond to your comment and, uh, let me know if you really want me to re respond to a comment. Then tell me you thanked, you did the thank thing. And I'll definitely be like, what's up, man? So, all right. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I have a Patreon too. Got to throw that in there. See ya.